Let me introduce Professor Tim Crane. I'm very pleased to be here to introduce him for a couple of reasons, one being the importance of the speaker, the other being the fact that he's a promoter of a kind of philosophy that uh, is not exactly the mainstream Anglo-Saxon analytic philosophy, but it rather tends to uh, open, uh, open up the uh, Anglo-Saxon analytic philosophy of mind to trends such uh, phenomenology and uh, the like. So I think that it will be a great occasion for all of us to listen from Professor Crane. I just say a few, a very few words about uh, our speaker. Uh, is present uh, the uh, Knightbridge Professor of Philosophy in Cambridge. And um, I take from the Wikipedia page dedicated to Professor uh, Crane, uh, page that depicts him uh, as a professor of philosophy who mostly works in the philosophy of mind and metaphysics. And uh, I would say that uh, uh, particular stress should be made on the fact that his contributions to philosophy include a defense of a non-physicalist account of the mind, a defense of a thesis that experiences non-conceptual content, and a defense of a thesis that intentionality is a mark of the mental. And uh, the, the author of uh, an enormous amount of works, I'll uh, quote only the, the books, the, uh, the most important books, aspects of psychologism, uh, that is just being published in 2014, The Objects of Thought, uh, a German translation, Intentionalität as Merkmal des Geistigen, and then uh, a formal work of him entitled Elements of Mind, that, if I'm not mistaken, was translated into Italian as uh, Phenomenon in Italian by Cortina uh, a few years ago. So, um, let me finish by Warmly welcoming Professor Crane to be here and uh, I'll give you the talk. Thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here in this, in this wonderful place in this famous college about which I've heard uh, an enormous amount. Um, I'm going to talk tonight um, uh, in one of the lectures in the series, What is Philosophy, which, which you're organizing here. And I want to talk about the relationship between two things. Uh, one is um, what we might call systematic philosophy. <coughs> a systematic philosophy is the investigation of philosophical questions, the attempts to answer philosophical questions and um, achieve progress in philosophy itself. Uh, the other is the study of the history of philosophy, the study of, the, of uh, the great works of the past, or the not so great works of the past, um, the study of what people used to think, the study of rejected views, of antiquated views, um, and views which are no longer our own. Um, and um, I, the question I want to ask is what is the relevance? of the second thing, the study of history of philosophy, to philosophy as such. And by philosophy as such, I mean systematic philosophy, the attempt to answer questions like, what is truth, what is being, what is reality? But I should say that in the tradition in which I, I have been educated and in which I've worked for, for all my life, uh, it's not problematic that there is such a thing. It's not believed to be problematic there is such a thing as systematic philosophy. I know that in other parts of the world, in, in uh, other parts of, of Europe and, uh, and, and the rest of the world, uh, the question of the possibility of philosophy is one of the central questions of philosophy itself. Uh, and if philosophy, of course, is impossible, then there's no role for systematic philosophy in thinking about truth, being, reality, the good, and so on. If that's your view, then um, you, I would ask you to suspend it for the purposes of this talk, because I'm, in this talk I'm going to um, assume that there is such a thing as systematic philosophy, and there's also such a thing as the study of the history of philosophy. That if we study the works of Kant, that's 
one thing. But what Kant himself was trying to do, the questions he, he himself was trying to answer, that's another. So my question is about the relationship between those things. And I think the interesting thing is that whether something is controversial depends partly on where you say it. And I think some things that I've said here, I'm going to say tonight, will be controversial in, in uh, analytic philosophy, and American philosophy, <coughs> and may not be so controversial in Italy. Uh, some things <coughs> will be controversial in Italy, which would not be controversial in, uh, um, in the English-speaking philosophy department. So I'll be very interested to see which things really are controversial, if anything, is what I said. So that's my preamble. I want to say, um, uh, uh, this is a question I want to discuss, what is the relevance or the relationship of the history of philosophy to philosophy as such? Uh, I want to distinguish this from two other questions, which I'm not going to answer. What is the reason for studying the history of philosophy at all? That's one question. <coughs> Why should anyone be interested in the history of philosophy? And the obvious answer is that the history of philosophy is part of the history of our culture. And if the history of our culture is worth studying, then the history of philosophy is. So that's not the question. Another question which I'm not going to discuss is why academic institutions like this one, or my own institution, should teach the history of philosophy as part of a philosophical education. If someone goes to study philosophy at my university, they get some lessons in the history of philosophy. They read some books by Hume or Kant or Nietzsche or Hegel, as well as studying philosophy. And I think that, that this is standard practice in philosophy departments throughout um, the UK that you study, and, and, and America and the rest of the world. So I know that you study historical works of philosophy when studying philosophy. But I'm not questioning that. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying it's a fact. Uh, I think it's a good thing. But that's not my question. I can put my question more starkly by saying this. If we're interested in pursuing the truth, then why should we bother ourselves with philosophical views which are obviously false? Now, now I, I say obviously false, and I say that, and some people may assume uh, what I mean by this. Um, <coughs> if you want to study the views, say, of, for example, um, Plotinus, or uh, Bishop Berkeley, or John Locke, or Kant, or Hegel, uh, I bet we could not find general agreement that the views of these philosophers are correct. Uh, it seems that the reason we have for studying these things is not because these views are necessarily true or correct. <laughs> to put it another way, we don't just study the true bits of those philosophers, if that was even a possibility. Um, and yet we think it's, that philosophers should consider these views. That philosophers should consider the views of their, their great dead predecessors, even though these views have no chance of being true. I say that Kant's transcendental idealism has no chance of being true. It cannot be what we should believe. You may disagree with me about that example. If you do, then just take another example. Plato's theory of the good, Plato's theory of the forms, Aristotle's theory of form and matter, Aquinas' theory of the soul, Whatever, there's always going to be a view which philosophers think is worthy of consideration, even though we know that it cannot be true. <coughs> so this is why my question is, if we're interested in pursuing the truth, why should we waste our time thinking about things that are obviously false? And remember that my question here isn't the educational pedagogical question, it's a question about what should a philosopher do when they're trying to find out to have to answer philosophical questions. Uh, there are two inadequate answers, it seems to me, which are very common um, when you ask people about this. And one, one is the uh, what we might call the, the prophylactic view, um, Santayana's famous comment that those who do not study history are compelled to repeat it, applied to philosophy. And you need to avoid the errors of the past, so look back at the past thinkers and see which errors they were making, and then try and avoid those errors. <coughs> now, there may be something in this, but um, I, um, for reasons that I hope will become obvious in my lecture, uh, I think this is a very misguided approach. Um, 
And one reason that it can't be the right approach is because it, it, there are too many errors. There are too many mistakes that people have made. Uh, and we don't think that we should go through all the mistakes that you could possibly make before going ahead and trying to answer a question yourself. Uh, that's, that's one answer, which I think is bad. The other is what we call the nuggets, or nuggets in the sense of gold. You get the, the gold nuggets in the stream and the, the, the panning for gold. And you think that well, there are some insights in the works of the philosophers in the past, and we need to find that. We need to find those insights. Now, I think this is closer to the truth. There are great insights in, in many of the philosophers we read, even those who have very, very strange views. And so and I think insights cannot be just restricted to true things that these philosophers happen to say. Uh, we have to think as rather the way they turn our attention to something, the way they recommend that we uh, consider a certain way of looking at a question, and so on. There's more to it than this, but nonetheless, oh, sorry, there's more to this second point, the Nuggets point, than there's the first one. Nonetheless, I think it's, it cannot be the whole story. Because, as I say, we spend a lot of our time considering views from the near and the recent and far distant past uh, which have no chance of being true, yeah. and which none of us could ever believe could have happened. So why do we do that? So my answer is going to be slightly different, and this is our, I will, there will not be any suspense, I will tell you what my answer is, this is my answer. I said that unless we have some genuine historical awareness of the problems we are addressing, we cannot claim to really know what these problems are. I think that the, the, the problems or questions of philosophy, we cannot know what they really are unless we have some kind of historical awareness of how they came about. Um, what I want to do for the rest of my lecture tonight is to try to defend that, that claim. History is needed to understand our questions. Um, now, this is a very complex topic, and I can't expect to um, uh, to answer it in, in tonight in any satis to your satisfaction. It reminds me of when I was interviewing an undergraduate applicant some years ago, and uh, and I said to her in the interview, "What do you think is the relationship between your mind and your body?" And she looked at me as if I was mad, and she said. But that's a very difficult question. And I said, well, I don't know, but try and answer it anyway. And she looked at me and said, you realize people have been thinking about this subject for thousands of years. Okay. I feel I'm in a little bit of that situation, but this is where we go. If there isn't hubris in philosophy, there isn't hubris anywhere. So, so this is my argument. And my argument's very simple. And since I'm an analytic philosopher in some sense, I put forward okay. arguments with premises. My first premise is that it appeals to the idea of a philosophical tradition. I say a philosophical tradition is a historically constituted collection of canonical texts together with a certain way of reading these texts. So there are two things I say there are in tradition. There's the canonical text of the tradition, and there's the way you read the text in those traditions. The second, my second point is that it's only in the context of a philosophical tradition that you can make real sense of the questions that philosophers are. Um, by the, the context of the philosophical tradition, I mean only by considering, to some extent, the tradition itself. Um, and my conclusion then is that we can only make real sense of the questions philosophers ask in the context of a historically constituted collection of canonical texts. Now, I, I, I expect that that conclusion would not be controversial in, uh, in this country. Uh, it would be somewhat controversial in America or the, the United States. Um, but some of the things I say on the way to the conclusion may be controversial. So the, my, the rest of my talk then will be in two parts. The first part will be to defend this premise about philosophical traditions. Um, and um, the second part will be about what it means to understand 
understand the question. Okay. So I, I, I mentioned the idea of canonical texts, the, the tradition involves um, canonical texts. Um, and I'm going to say a little bit about what, that, what those are. Um, I'm also going to say a little bit about the distinction between analytic and uh, so-called continental philosophy. Continental philosophy is an Anglo-American term for a family of European traditions of philosophy, sometimes including Hegel and Hegelianism, um, phenomenology, um, and post-war, some post-war French philosophy. Um, uh, and I'm going to say that in order to illustrate what I'm saying about, about traditions. I think that it's true that if the notion of analytical philosophy is a um, problematic one, uh, just as not as problematic as the notion of um, continental philosophy, but it's a, it's a problematic one. But if you ask someone what analytical philosophy is, the standard textbook response is to say that it's the um, tradition of philosophy that began in the beginning of the 20th century uh, with um, Bertrand Russell and G. Moore in, in this place, Cambridge, which is my university. Uh, <coughs> what did that exactly actually involve? Well, it's, uh, that's a good question. The, the short answer is that 19th century British philosophy was dominated by a form of Hegelianism, um, particularly British form of Hegelianism, in philosophers such as Bradley, Green, and um, in Cambridge, actually, McTaggart. Uh, and so there was a very strong idealist uh, tradition in the second half of the 19th century in, in Britain, uh, in England and in Scotland. Um, Russell and Moore um, rejected this tradition. They, they refused to talk in its terms and started talking in a different way. And that's generally taken to be the beginning of analytical philosophy. Um, in particular, they rejected idealism. They rejected the idea that truth was a matter of degree. They said truth was absolute, yes or no, black or white. They said the truth attached to propositions. Um, the truth was mind independent and that judgment was the fundamental relation we stood into the proposition. And then there was an enormous amount of work there on what a proposition was and what the nature of judgment was. Those were the early themes of the early 20th century uh, English philosophy. Uh, and the, the way that the, the tradition becomes constructed, I say, and I don't, I don't take this to be a controversial thing, is around its canonical texts, some of which um, may be canonical texts here, some of which may not. Um, Russell's on the works of Frege, for example, became canonical texts because of Russell's interest in the foundations of mathematics and his attempt to employ some of Frege's ideas to defend the, the, the thesis that mathematics was reducible to logic. Um, so there's a Frege's works, Russell's own work on denoting, um, is, a, is a canonical text in, in analytic philosophy, the problems of philosophy, print of the ethic. Um, just, this is just a, an, a sample of canonical texts. In this text, in the sense that anyone who regarded themselves as well trained in this tradition would be obliged to know something about these books and to have read them. And there are, there, of course, there are many others, and there are different ones in different places. So some think it's more uh, canonical in some parts of the world than not. It's a part of the tradition, so there are sub-traditions within the tradition. Yeah. I'm not going to talk in detail about that. That's an empirical historical question, and I'm not really a historian at all. Yeah. What I want to stress, though, is that, there's, that we cannot just simply define the tradition by listing its canonical texts. Um, and th there are two reasons for this. One is that um, it's very important to traditions as they develop that they actually misrepresent the texts that they're studying. A reading of a text is a misreading of it often. Creative reading can often be a, a misreading. 
uh, an example of that is um, Michael Dunn's work on Frege, um, which I won't say too much about here, but um, Michael Dunn wrote a famous book in 1974 called Frege's Frege Philosophy of Language, where he put forward the view that Frege, the German logician, was actually a philosopher of language. <coughs> he was trying to answer the question of how thought connects to reality. Um, and he, Dummett has actually said that analytical philosophy itself is founded on the views of Frege, particularly on the view that um, an account of thought must be given by giving an account of language. Um, now, those who know Frege's work, and those who have just immersed themselves simply in Frege's work rather than trying to mine Frege's work for philosophical insights, generally think that this view is, uh, is entirely inaccurate. That Frege was not a philosopher of language. Frege was uh, interested in the foundations of mathematics, was interested in the foundations of mathematics as a science, and logic played a role in the foundations of mathematics, but there was very little in his work that could be called, in any sense, philosophy of language. Now, I want to say that that doesn't matter, in a sense. In a sense, that doesn't matter. Because what Dunnett did was create, by having readings of these canonical texts, he created <coughs> a framework for discussion a series of questions, which he linked back to Frege and thereby found insights within Frege's work. Um, now if anyone wants to discuss that, we can discuss that example later. I just use it as an example of how the misreading of a philosopher can be created. The second reason that, I, that, that we can't identify the, the tradition simply with the text is that um, some texts can belong to more than one tradition. Um, and so there are a number of examples in um, contemporary philosophy. I, I use the example here of uh, Hubert Dreyfus's interpretation of Heidegger, uh, but there are other cases, uh, you know, for example, Nietzsche. Nietzsche's works <coughs> started to be read by analytical philosophers, um, like Bernard Williams, for example. Last few decades, um, Hegel's work has been read by a number of analytical philosophers, Robert Brown and Charles Taylor, have uh, formed interpretations of Hegel or ideas based on Hegel's ideas, um, and Heidegger being in time to be taken by uh, the philosopher I mentioned on the previous slide, Hubert Dreyfus, uh, as uh, putting forward a kind of proto inactivist body-centered conception of intentionality, um, which is supposed to undermine various Cartesian starting points in the philosophy of mind. Um, now, what I want to say about that is to two things uh, about this fact. One is the fact that these texts can appear on among canonical texts of analytical philosophy does not make Nietzsche or Hegel an analytical philosopher. And, and the other is that um, the fact that Bernard Williams, say, goes on to discuss Nietzsche does not make Bernard Williams stop being an analytical philosopher. It's what's, rather, what's rather going on is that the analytical philosopher comes to the texts with a certain collection of questions and assumptions, and they try and answer those assumptions or, or interrogate those assumptions by reading the texts in question. And once again, as with um, Dummett and Frege, the case of Heide, Dreyfus on Heidegger is an example of creative misreading, I, I believe. I'm no expert on Heidegger. Uh, but I think that it's very unlikely that what Dreyfus says about Heidegger is very close to Heidegger's own preoccupations. Um, nothing really depends on me being right about that, but I, I believe that to be true. There it's Heidegger. So, so that this leads me then to the second defining aspect of the tradition, the way that the canonical texts are, are read. Um, as I said, questions are presupposed in reading a text, so if I go to uh, 
um, read text by um, uh, Husserl, for example, who's a philosopher I'm interested in, and I, I have questions in mind that I want him to answer, so I'm very interested in we were talking this afternoon with some of the students about uh, that question of the representation of the non-existent. And I've been thinking about that question for some time, and I found myself being led to read some of Husserl's work on this, um, and I found it very illuminating. Now that didn't mean I became Husserlian or I took on Husserl's phenomenology as a general method in philosophy, uh, rather that I saw this question being addressed in a particular way in this text, and I saw that this was a way to read it. But I had a way, a particular way of reading this text. The ways of reading are central to the tradition too. Um, um, and I think that the answers then that you give to the questions shape the tradition itself. So the tradition is nothing outside its texts and the ways of reading those texts, which include the assumptions that you bring to the text and the, and the, um, uh, and, and the, and the answers that you get. And you might think, that, so this is a picture I'm attacking here, is the picture I think I was taught as an undergraduate, so this might be a sort of Freudian rejection of all my uh, philosophical parentage, but um, and maybe it may be that no one in this room has ever taught this, that there's an idea that there is a menu of philosophical questions, that there just are questions which are philosophical, uh, and anyone who's a real philosopher can recognize when a question is philosophical, regardless of whether they've read anything. And this is the picture I just think, well, if I think it's completely wrong. There's no such thing as a fixed menu of philosophical questions. Which questions are central changes for all time, uh, across time? Um, and, um, and the questions may not even be intelligible to you until you've read the texts in question. Um, now, so that's, as I say, a bad picture. That's a little bit of a caricature. Of it. So let me say something more about some alternative conceptions of analytical philosophy briefly. One is that analytical philosophy is a, is, a part, is a school of philosophy that puts an emphasis on logic. In particular, that it uses logic uh, to represent its arguments so that the arguments can be shown to be deductively valid or sound. Um, now, I think this is part of the self-conception of some parts of analytical philosophy, uh, but it simply isn't a good description of what goes on. There's very little philosophy for which logic, and uh, very little analytical philosophy for which any advanced sense of logic or knowledge of logic is relevant, is necessary. Uh, there are very few arguments in analytical philosophy of any worth um, which, have, which have been, there are, there are very few arguments of any worth which have been relied on being able to formalize, formalize informal logic in order to be successful. Uh, and this seems to me this, is, this should not be surprising. Because all logic can represent are the formal features of arguments. What logic is is the study of validity, the validity of arguments, or the validity of structures or something. That's what logic is. And yet, a lot of the most important concepts in philosophy, a lot of the most important phenomena in philosophy, free will, consciousness, the good, have no formal features. There is no logic of consciousness. Uh, you might say, I mean, it's, in a way, it's a category mistake to say there's a logic of consciousness. And logic is about the formal principles of reason. There's no logic of consciousness. People used to use the word logic in, in English philosophy. They used to use the word logic just to mean the general principles governing the concept. And that's a perfectly okay way to use logic. But that has nothing, but in that sense of logic, analytical philosophy has no great claim to be particularly logical um, or to appeal to logic. It doesn't have, any, it's not, it doesn't have a unique right to appeal to logic. Um, what is true is that a lot of the philosophers who have, been, who have done great work in analytical philosophy have also done work in logic. So here, Russell, of course, um, Ramsey, um, uh, Frege, um, Quine, Kripke, Button. 
these are philosophers who've done work in logic or form, uh, semantics or, ma or mathematics, even uh, mathematical logic. They've done work in this, but uh, that doesn't mean that the rest of their philosophical work is an application of logic. Yeah. So I think logic is a, is a misleading model here. I think similarly the idea of argument is part of the self-image of analytical philosophy that they, in particular, are particularly strong on arguments and ways of putting things in terms of premises and conclusions. And it's true that that can be a good part of the training of analytical philosophy, but it's not. It cannot be what analytical philosophy consists in if we agree with the earlier definition that analytical philosophy was invented in Cambridge in 1900. Because there were plenty of arguments before Cambridge in the 1900 that the great philosophers of the past had arguments. Um, so analytical philosophy cannot have a, a special claim to be the philosophy of argument. Finally, I'll um, uh, to express skepticism about the relevance of natural science to analytical philosophy. What I mean here is I don't think that it's the relationship between analytical philosophy and natural science that is um, the signal <coughs> of, of analytical philosophy. So yeah, but I won't say anything more about that because I want to get on to my main point. Yeah. So, what, so these are alternative conceptions. My conception is what I would call historicist. It's about this idea of a tradition, a canonical text with ways of reading these texts. And that's what I think analytical philosophy is a tradition in that sense. What about continental philosophy, as we call it? Well, I put the word in inverted commas because um, it's somewhat controversial. The word uh, terminology, piece of terminology, I think. Um, the, the word as it's used in, in contemporary Anglo uh, Anglophone philosophy tends to cover two sorts of things. One is uh, 19th century, 19th century German philosophy. So Hegel is sort of the beginning of analytical continental philosophy. Schopenhauer and Nietzsche are continental philosophers, and Heidegger, of course, and Husserl, so German computing history. More narrowly, I think that the, um, the term is used for post-war French philosophy. And there, I think, it's in that sense that you get a distinctive style in reading someone like um, Deleuze or Badiou. Um, you, you, you're definitely encountering a very different style of philosophy, even from um, Hegel, or even from Nietzsche or Schopenhauer. Um, what's the relationship between these things? Well, I, I don't want to venture an opinion. Um, in a way, the category is just too broad to be worthwhile. But I, I, I'd like to draw your attention to something that Alan Badiou said about recently about his own um, period of philosophy. Uh, not lacking in self importance, uh, Alan Badiou said that um, he is living in one of the three great moments of philosophy. The three great moments of philosophy he thinks are the moment of Aristotle and Plato. The moment of Kant, Kant and Hegel, and the moment of post war French philosophy. But well, whatever we think of that, um, uh, he did actually characterize this moment quite well. Uh, he said it was characterized by three things. One was what he calls political engagement. It turns out, of course, what he means by political engagement is Marxist, Marxism, uh, various interpretations and interpretations on interpretations of. Uh, often framed by the events of, in Paris in 1968, uh, which has still left their mark on the French intellectual life, even though they left almost no mark anywhere else. Um, psychoanalysis is the second uh, theme, he thinks, which characterizes uh, <coughs> is the French, post war French philosophy. <coughs> and again, there, what's important for the canonical texts are. Not, you don't go back to Freud, you start with, with Lacan and his, and his followers. And so that, that part of the tradition is very much internal to the French cultural scene. Um, and the third is literature, engagement with literature. And that's an interesting 
the relationship between philosophy and literature is not something I can really comment on here, but I think certainly among a number of the leading French philosophers of the post-war period, uh, the idea that philosophy and literature have an intimate connection was something that was an assumption of starting point. Um, in uh, in Anglophone philosophy, that's not true. This is from his book, The Adventure of French Philosophy, which is a selection of essays, and I recommend the introduction to that if you want a, a very clear description of what Badu's current worldview is. Um, anyway, that's where I've got to is, is that analytical philosophy is a tradition. Continental philosophy in this, in, in this more specialized sense of post-war French philosophy is a kind of tradition too. Uh, it's a tradition in the sense in which I mean collection of texts. Uh, texts can, can belong to different traditions. What unifies the text under a tradition is the way of reading the text, the questions you bring to the texts, and the kind of answers you're looking for. Now I'm going to briefly defend my second premise, which is that it's only in the context of a tradition understood in this way that we can make real sense of the questions that philosophers ask. I, uh, it's impossible to give a demonstration of, this, of a thesis like this. Um, what I want to do, rather, is illustrate it by example, um, and then see whether the examples can be, can be generated, can be extended to other areas of the subject. The example I'm going to take, then, is, the, is that question that I asked you to be, how is your mind related to your body? Um, mind-body problem, is it, it's known. It's something that uh, I've done a bit of work on myself in the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, I think one of the, one, one, two things about questions like this stand out um, when you reflect on them, when you step back and what's going on. You think, why would anyone ask that question in the first place? And the other thing that stands out is, when, that, when you do understand why that question is being asked, you see that only certain answers are appropriate or acceptable at a certain time. Um, so, in, a, in the way that um, this is discussed in recent philosophy, uh, the question about the relationship between our minds and our bodies is answered by putting forward an opposition between a kind of dualism you think of mind and body as entirely separate, and a materialism which treats mind and body as the same, or mind as an aspect of body and matter. Now, I think it's worth observing that, that that answer is, that, that way of getting you into that answer, that, sorry, the way of getting you into thinking that only those answers are relevant is a very interesting fact. I, I believe that the range of answers that we have is constrained by the tradition, and that actually originality in philosophy, in, in some sense progress in philosophy, is a matter of subverting the tradition, uh, undermining the question, of showing that the question is based on assumptions which are um, contestable, false, or even absurd. Yeah. I think this is actually what Wittgenstein tried to do with the mind-body problem to show how our, the assumptions we were making about the mind and body were uh, deeply confused um, and that we shouldn't think that we have to choose between materialism and dualism as if we have to give the answer one or two to this question. Um, other philosophers have tried to do similar things. I mean, actually, John Searle, in a book published about 20 years ago, um, has a very... Um, forthright attempt to show that this question is just mistaken since it's assuming that mind and body are opposites or oppositions, that you're always thinking of mind as opposed to body or body as opposed to mind. Um, but the point I want to make at the moment, and I'm going to come back to originality in a minute, but the point I want to make is that it's the tradition that constrains the range of answers that we have. And the tradition here uh, goes back at least as far as they come. Well, the great portrait 
case of the philosopher, I think it's like wonderful. Uh, now, of course, in, in Descartes' meditations, he, he said one of the things he was trying to establish was the real distinction between mind and body. Uh, but that required a whole rethinking of what, it, of what the mind was, a whole new concept of the mark of the mental, of what the mental is, and a rejection of the Aristotelian tradition before him. Um, uh, and it was in terms of that whole revolution in the way of thinking about the mind, these questions then came later to be, to be asked. But it could have gone differently. Could, things could have turned out differently. The Aristotelian view of the mind, where the, 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 so to speak, the three-tiered soul, where you have the vegetable soul, and the animal soul, and the, and the rational soul, and you have these three levels of the soul, um, is something that still makes sense, could make sense to us, even though it's dropped out of um, mainstream philosophical um, questioning in some parts of the world. Um, Here's Rembrandt's picture of Aristotle contemplating a bus of Homer. The only purpose of this picture is that it's a beautiful picture. So rather than have a picture of some, some American philosopher with a beard, I've got a picture of Aristotle. Yeah. So in this, in what are the, the point I'm trying to make about the mind-body problem here is that the various positions that we have can seem to us as if they are the only ones possible. So that we can get ourselves into a position in philosophy where we're arguing between a number of positions where it just seems that they are the only ones that are possible. And I think if we think of our problems as just being given, uh, given to us without any historical context, then I think it makes this picture makes much more sense, the idea that there are there are some very simple propositions, and you have to choose among these propositions. Um, the positions arise as they do, I say, by contrast, in relation to the canonical texts. So it's the canonical texts that set the positions, and the canonical texts are not revealing the platonic nature of the problem. Now, my final the thing I want to say is about the idea of understanding a question, what it is to understand a question. Now, I said early on, at the beginning of my talk, I said uh, that you can only really understand the question, the philosophical question, if you know which the tradition from which it comes, if you have some historical knowledge of the tradition from which it comes. Um, what is it to really know a question? Well, I think these things are it's related to what I said about having a sense of the possibilities. To understand the question, I say, is not just to understand the words involved. I mean, in no obvious sense it is, um, but in the sense that you understand the language, you understand simple questions. You know, someone says, where's the milk? And you know what the words mean, and you know that they're asking, where's the milk? Um, but a better understanding of questions involves what kind of thing encounters an acceptable answer to it. If you're in a kitchen and you're making coffee, and someone <coughs> says, where's the milk? Um, and, so, and they say, well, there's plenty in the shop. This would not be a helpful answer. It could be a joke, but it could be a uh, <coughs> sarcastic comment to indicate that they haven't bought any milk recently. Or you said the milk is still in the cow, meaning no one's managed to get any milk yet. Uh, this would be a kind of answer, but you could only understand that answer if you understood that some other kind of speech act was being played in that situation. So this is the same, I think, with philosophical questions. To understand the philosophical question is not just to understand the words involved, um, to get into the habit of repeating them, but it's also to understand what kind of things could count as acceptable answers to it. And there are ways of subverting questions too. I like a story from Bob Dylan when he was a protest. When Bob Dylan was a protest singer, and he was asked by a journalist, "How many protest singers are there, Bob?" And Dylan said, "Either 136 or 142." Um, and I think that that could also be a good way. Something analogous could be done with um, philosophical questions. You, know, you just you simply don't want to go there. Someone asks a question, and you just don't want to. Um, 
you don't want to address the question. So you can subvert the question through irony or joke or, um, or mockery or some, some other way. Um, and that's, of course, a kind of thing that you see in some so-called post-modernist writers like um, Derrida, for example. One of the things that he does is try to subvert uh, the, the, the assumption behind questions often with what, I want, what seems to me a rather weak attempt at humour, but that must be a, a difference between understanding that style of humour. But that's what he's doing. This brings me then to the question of progress in philosophy, what that could involve. And of course it can involve many things. And I said that what we're doing in philosophy is that we're looking for the truth, or we're looking for illumination, or we're looking for understanding. Subverting so a question can be a form of progress, showing political questions based on some false assumption or some misleading assumption can be a way of showing that the question is no longer the one we need to ask. Um, and so that, I, I, in a very, this is really just an example of what I mean by philosophical progress. I don't think this is the only way we can make progress. But I think if you accept that subverting questions is or can be a form of progress, then I think it's wrong to think of postmodern skepticism as, um, as against philosophical progress. Postmodern skepticism, in this sense, is a way of trying to make progress by showing how questions are based on assumptions which make oppositions, unnecessary oppositions, uh, open to you, and so on. So that's really, uh, that's a very small comment about philosophical progress. Um, but uh, what I'd like to do, finally, then, is just sum up my uh, so three lessons from this reflection on philosophy and its history. Yeah. This is the first one, this is my explicit um, theme, if you like, that understanding the awareness of the history of a question can help us to understand better what the question really is. Yeah. And so rather than saying, what's the relationship between your mind and your body, um, you have to say, well, people first asked this question when they were thinking in terms of an Aristotelian idea of substance, and then you have to explain what an Aristotelian idea of substance is, what Descartes' application of that idea was, and how Descartes influenced the tradition in raising that question. And then you can say, does any of this make sense to you? Is there, is this any, is there anything here that you can believe? And my second lesson is that the awareness of the history of the question can make you sensitive to the contingency of the question. By the contingency, I mean the fact that it's being asked now and hasn't been asked before, the fact that it may have never been asked at all, and the fact that it's based on particular things that happened. The question is based on things that, things that happened in philosophy, uh, which may have no further explanation. One of the things that's dominated analytic philosophy, for example, in the discussion of the mind-body problem, it's a debate over physicalism or materialism. Yeah. And the way that this question became formulated in the 20th century relied on the idea that for physicalism to be true, everything has to be expressed in the language of physics. And this idea, which kind of comes from Rudolf Kahn and his the logical empiricists, dominated discussions of the mind-body problem until people realized that that was just a particular obsession of the logical empiricists of Carnap's day. And now we don't have to think of the mind-body problem in that way. My final lesson is related to that, which is that historical awareness, I think, can help to remove the sense of incomprehensibility that we get in our encounters with philosophical problems. I think this is something I think I've learned from trying to teach philosophy in the last uh, 25 years or so. Um, is that when students first encounter philosophical questions, it's not that they think that obviously uh, the answers are obvious or that they're, or that these questions are trivial. They have no idea what the question is. It's, it's, you understand the words involved, but you don't have any idea of why anyone else would ask a question like this. I don't say this happens all the time, but it does happen quite a lot, and the way. I think to, to reduce this sense of incomprehensibility is to acquaint people with how the questions evolved. I want to take an example here um, from um, the, well, the, 
discussion of philosophy of time for the last 50 years, uh, where a lot of philosophers identified their debates in relation to um, the views of Matek, the Cambridge idealist I mentioned earlier on. Um, Matek thought that time was unreal, and had an argument for why time was unreal. But often what students are told is that Matek thought that time was unreal. Here's his argument. It turns out that the argument has a flaw, but we can keep McTaggart's, some of McTaggart's points while rejecting the claim that time is unreal. This is the way to put it. But I think there's a prior question, which is, why would anyone say that time was unreal? What does that even mean, to say that time is unreal? And here, I think, this is where you can only understand that question if you understand it in the context of the kind of idealism that McTaggart was putting forward. The, 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 the reality of the world does not lie within experience. Uh, and that, that what, what we see is partial, what we experience is partial. Time is a kind of illusion which reflects an underlying reality which is non-temporal. That's what Montaigne thought. Um, if you explain that kind of view to, to, to people, then they can see why, we, we hope they can see why, someone might ask the question, is time real or unreal? And then you can engage with the question. So I should, should say that I'm not recommending here that the only way to study philosophy is to study the history of philosophy. I'm definitely not recommending that because my question presupposes that there is systematic philosophy and that you can study, you can be a systematic philosopher um, uh, and try and achieve progress in philosophy. Um, so I don't, there's a famous uh, quote from Burton Drebber, the Harvard Carver philosopher and logician, who was um, very influenced by Quine and Wittgenstein to, to reject the whole philosophical tradition. He believed in the history of philosophy, he believed in logic, but that was all. And Drebber's famous remark was, um, garbage is garbage, but the history of garbage is scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I think that's a very, it's a very interesting remark, but it's not true. Well, I mean, it may be true, but it's, uh, it's not true of philosophy, I think. Uh, so I'm, I'm asking, I'm giving an account here of why we should, as systematic philosophers, try and understand our questions in a historical context. Uh, I'm not rejecting the possibility of systematic philosophy. So, um, I'd like to close with this quote from G.E. Moore, um, where Moore said in his autobiography, I do not think that the world or the sciences would ever have suggested to me any philosophical problems. What has suggested philosophical problems to me is things which other philosophers have said about the world or the sciences. Um, and this is often taken to be a sign of Moore's modesty or his obtuseness, or the fact that he wasn't in some way a real philosopher. Because a real philosopher would simply look at the world and be puzzled by the world. Uh, um, now, I don't know what to say about more, and I think there's probably an element of all those things in, in that. But um, I think if we think of more, not to speak about himself, but to speak about a whole philosophical tradition, then what he says is actually deeply true. Thank you very much.
like to rephrase uh, the, the one of the sentences, uh, while garbage is garbage, but it's really garbage is a scholarship. Well, that is a very important thought because it well has to be rephrased. I will rephrase in the way uh, that what is wrong is not irrelevant. You can be badly wrong, but be very influential in the history of religions. So uh, it's relevant to understand why that was relevant indeed. Uh, I just take an example from uh, astronomy. Uh, it's very important to understand why the uh, idea that only the perfect circular movement were allowed for the planets, which is a platonic idea in the first place, was so influential throughout the history of astronomy, and it took up to Kepler to get rid of it. It was very wrong, but indeed very influential. So history of ideas is very important to understand at, at, la at large history of culture and history of civilization. So history of philosophy is a certain an important part of it. So it's relevant even if wrong. I would entirely agree with that. That, 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 that is um, the false ideas, wrong ideas, uh, understanding why they had the effect that they did is incredibly important for understanding our culture. Um, my, so that was one of the questions I said at the beginning I wasn't going to, going to answer because I, I, I'm too ignorant to, to have a general um, conception of that. Uh, what interested me rather was the question of why these views should matter to us as philosophers pursuing the truth. I suppose the background for this was that when I was, the, uh, I was again a sort of Freudian um, autobiography, was that uh, when I was a graduate student, one of my supervisors said to me that the history of philosophy was no more relevant to doing philosophy than the history of physics was to doing physics. And that physicists don't learn Newton when they go to the first year of their degree program. So why, why the hell do students in philosophy have to learn their card account? And that question has been preoccupied me ever since then, because so I thought, you can't do it right. Just a very brief reply, I teach history of physics, so the physicists. <laughs> I'm sorry. I teach history of physics, not the physicists. So we could never go on this discussion about the relevance of that. So that shows that you have a much more civilized education system. <laughs> we do. So I think I can really understand how, um, if philosophical paradigms or tradition, as you call them, are, so to a certain extent, uh, commensurable, how can a tradition be an instrument to understand philosophical questions? Because that to me would presuppose that we have an understanding of that many of questions which leads us to understanding how different traditions have spelled them out. Because I was actually reading a paper <coughs> some years ago about this topic, which I found quite, quite innovative. Um, and I thought of another part of it, which is similar and fairly parallel to yours. Um, and it was expressed by Kantians and neo Kantians, especially within the 20th century German tradition. I mean, not the idealistic philosophers, but the neo Kantians, yes. and part of the logical empiricists as well. So they think that there are traditions and they do spell these questions differently, in a sense that they cannot be understood from the standpoint of another tradition, but they pretend, sorry, they maintain that they can understand philosophically that there is a list of questions that, although unknowable, directs the knowledge and directs the progress of philosophy altogether. So this is what Kant calls the X uh, in his theoretical philosophy, which is directly transposed to the philosophy of history. Yeah. Uh, and I think that would make sense of the claim that for the institutions are a way to understand what the general philosophical questions are. And aside from that, I think that from a position that argues that to a certain extent paradigms are incommensurable, a normative question would follow, that is, what's philosophy worth then? So, an answer to both of this question might be to embrace this other part of it, which is for many experts similar, as I said, and it's also expressed, I think, by Lovejoy and Bachman, who is um, name the book is really <coughs> human face. He makes such, such a commitment to 
this similar way of approaching the thing. Although, although it's not so relative, it's not. Um, uh, I find it less less extreme. I would say. Yeah. You, you find you find patterns. <laughs> less extreme than the claim that these philosophical traditions are incommensurable, because I don't see how it follows that we can understand the questions if we are in a tradition and we have to interpret the other tradition that was before. Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, yeah, I know it's a bit of larger question, yeah. perhaps out of an impression of mine. Well, there are two, two questions, really. I mean, the first is how, if, how can they be, um, if they're incommensurable, then how this leads to a kind of relativism, doesn't this mean that? Yeah, how can we just remind that there is a manual of philosophical questions yeah. with the other measure? And yes, and sorry, the second question in relation to. Yeah, would it rely to this other paradigm that developed similarly to yours, but arguing that there is a, a many of philosophical yeah. questions? Although we cannot really find them out for every tradition that we imply once and for all. So I don't want this to be relativism uh, in the sense, because I think there's, well, I don't know that it's. Depends what relativism means. Uh, in a way, I don't think the paradigms are so incommensurable. Um, so I think, but what you have to do in order to understand a thinker within another tradition is to try and get inside their assumptions and see what's central to them. Uh, it's not enough to just take their words and see whether the, the words strike you as true. So I think it is possible for someone, say, for, for a dog, it's possible for someone is an analytical philosopher to understand Heidegger, for example. I think that's, um, if it was strictly incommensurable, and if the paradigms were strictly incommensurable, then that wouldn't be possible. Um, now the point about whether there is, there could be some sort of, so to speak, menu of questions out there. I, I think I'd rather put that in, in another way, um, just referring to various features of human psychology. Uh, and I think that there are, because obviously that what I said at the end can't be entirely right, that philosophy only started because philosophers said things, and that philosophers said other things in response to what other philosophers said. That can't be the whole story, because someone had to start the whole thing in the first place. Here I want to just be more uh, sort of naturalistic and more descriptivist about what's going on. And that there is a certain temperament people have to ask questions of a certain kind. Um, it's a very good thing that um, there's a philosopher in California who said that philosophy was um, the attempt to answer questions that come naturally to children using methods that come naturally to lawyers. <laughs> Which I think is, is a very so good description of say. That reminds me of Stanley Cavell's quotes about what this philosophy is, arguing that it's like the way of answering their children's problems, yeah, with an English language. Uh-huh, uh -huh. right, I didn't know that about the Cavell's, but that's, yeah. Um, so, but I, I think that idea that there are questions that are naturally to children, there, there is a kind of natural philosophical urge, I think, um, which manifests itself across history in various ways. So rather than seeing the being, so to speak, a, a menu of questions which, which are lying behind our attempts to find them um, in this sort of platonic, almost platonic way. And I rather think that we, we have a natural tendency to ask questions of a certain sort. Uh, and once that's going, the tendency becomes amplified and amplified by people talking to each other about this and, and creating a tradition. Uh, so I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm resistant to the platonic suggestion <coughs> rather than the neo Kantian suggestion. Yeah, just the, just the moment. Because the idea would be that to take an analogy in model theory, the idea would be that different models are different interpretations of an intended model. And that's exactly the analogy that Patrick makes from the history of philosophy. So it seems to be uh, models related to the intended one but using different interpretation relations. So, in a sense, there is a relation between the intended model and the others because they all, they all represent the world giving different names and assigning different relations to their terms. But in a sense they're comparable to what the real description
position B, although we're not in a semi position to determine it. Thank you. Uh, yeah. There's something in that analogy, but I think it's, it's also a bit misleading, like all of that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I 
I, uh, I think there's a difference between a system being the best possible one they could have had at that time and being uh, true at that time. Because um, we need to understand, to understand true at that time, we need to understand why it was that something could be true at one time but not at another time. I, I don't mean things like, you know, this morning I was in England, it was a dead man this this afternoon I was here. But I mean, how a theory could be true at one time but not true at another time. Uh, so I, I think that idea doesn't make sense. So I think I have to go for the, the line that we're approaching, the second view. Uh, even though I think it's got to be unintelligible why people, part of what we try and do in a historical understanding is make it intelligible why people thought what they did. I think in the case of Plotinus, and I remember it's rather difficult. Or Spinoza. I don't know. Yes, I, but I suppose the line behind what I say is a sort of absolutist view of reality, whether we can get at reality. Theories, and theories can be more or less correct about that. Okay. I was really puzzled uh, with the idea of progress in philosophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you said, uh, it is mainly subverting questions and identifying hidden uh, assumptions. And connecting to the, the questions, uh, the question rather. Uh, asked. Um, I would like to um, uh, to say that first what do you think of the uh, organic account of the history of philosophy, the systematic one, like the one Hegel tried to build. And so um, in that sense the progress of philosophy is, uh, is uh, understood understa understa in a different way in, in which the progress uh, is uh, uh, displayed in the your way, in your view. And um, after all, the problem is about truth, I think. Because if, if we admit that uh, questions can all, always be subverted by other questions, and there can be always hidden assumptions that we didn't consider, if we admit that, then we have also to admit that philosophy can never deal with truth. Because no construction in time can ever be uh, certain to have reached some truth aspect or to deal with truth. So I think progress is li strictly linked with truth. And so since philosophy aims to truth, we should consider whether philosophy must admit it will, it will, should, it will never uh, reach truth, so it's just a continuous research in the uncertainty, or philosophy is a system that once ha uh, it has reach some of some points, some fixed points, then can build some real progress about truth and what is and what is uh, not deniable. Mm -hmm. So the truth, the concept of truth is not deniable. Thank you. Well thank you. That's a very eloquent question. I um, it really touches on things that I don't I'm not entirely sure how to answer but um, I, I I should say that when I said this thing about subverting questions, I don't think that's the only way philosophy makes progress. So I mean, you know, you know, inventing new concepts or new frameworks or um, uh, clarifying certain fundamental distinctions, certain uh, or just phenomena in the world, the clarification of phenomena, the classification. Of that's these are all modes of progress. Um, so I didn't mean, I shouldn't have said if I did, but the only way for us to make progress is by subverting questions. That would be a far too deconstructionist conception of what I want to do. Um, and I do think it's a real question of how you can achieve truth. Um, if, and the question that you raise, as you put it, how you can achieve truth that it's always possible to find assumptions in the question which can be because um, I think you can. Um, and I think that some of the, what, what, what you can't do is 
is establish for all time the truth or validity or um, indubitability of your assumptions. You have to realize you're making assumptions, and that when you make an assumption, then you go, you end up. Uh, let, let me give you an example of that. I think something I, I think this has been recent progress in philosophy, and I felt it was. The discussion started by Locke about what makes a person the same person. Uh, Locke had a, a definition of what a person was, where he said a person is a uh, thinking, reasoning being that considers itself as a self, as the same thinking, reasoning being at different times and places, or something like that. So a person was defined in terms of a creature that's capable of self consciousness. Um, and then there's a lot of debate about whether that's the adequate. But then there's been some wonderful work by some philosophers um, in England, actually, with um, Paul Stone and David Williams, who made, I think, real progress with understanding how you could accept that definition of a person uh, while still having a sort of more biologically and psychologically realistic account of the human being, because, or rather, of the human being that you are. For example, if I believe that I was once a fetus, but a fetus isn't a person by Locke's definition of person. So, what should I say? Does that mean I'm not a person? And, um, and what Paul Stone says is that what it should say is that you're not essentially a person, that you could have existed without being a person. Now, there are lots of, I just use that as an example because when I fully understood that view, it made lots of things clear to me about this debate about personal identity. But of course, in that view, I'm making assumptions. I make the assumptions that I make the assumption that I was once a fetus. I make the assumption that that a person is what Locke says a person is. Um, making assumptions about the persistence of things that things can belong to different kinds. I'm making all sorts of assumptions. Um, that doesn't stop me from believing that also this view is true. View is true, and I, think it's, and I think it's progress. When you look back before that, those distinctions were made, you look back to the philosophical literature on this, you see confusion. So, this what I'm saying is I don't really know the answer to your question. I don't believe the organic view. I think that's all I can say. I mean, philosophy is organic in some metaphorical sense, but not, not in a Hegelian sense. Thank you once again very much for this wonderful talk. Thank you.